Good morning and welcome to worship at Pleasant Hill Presbyterian Church. I'm Pastor Jenny Sankey and today I'm joined in worship leadership by Pastor Jody Andrade. We also have, will have the music from the PHPC Chancel Choir directed by Steve Dean to enjoy. And our worship videos are always edited and produced by Claire Kaiser to whom we are grateful. A couple announcements for you today. There is no learn and serve this week as originally scheduled before or after worship, but there is a PHPC family pool party for families with kids, and you can find out all the details of that. It starts at 1130 today, Sunday, um, and you can find that in your church newsletter. Uh, our only other announcement is that coming up, we want you to mark your calendars for Sunday, August 8th. There will be a back to school celebration following worship that day. And we hope that um, all of y'all will come by and there'll be some details to come in your newsletter about how you can contribute to that and help send our kids back to school this fall. It's time to take a moment to breathe, to remember why we are worshiping here today as we prepare our hearts and minds to worship God. Let us call ourselves to worship. Come, let us worship our God, for there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Come, let us worship our one God and parent of all, who is above all and through all and in all. God calls us to come as one body. We come with humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another in love.
It's time for confession. God created the world and said, the world is good. And we are part of that creation. But God also created us with the gift of freedom. And we are free to make mistakes. Now in our prayer of confession, let's take to God how we have fallen short. Let us pray. God, you have called us to live lives worthy of the calling to which we have been called. But we confess to you and each other that we have not always spoken the truth in love. We have not always made every effort to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Forgive us, and by your grace, help us to grow in every way into him who is our head, Jesus Christ. Amen. People, hear the good news. Through the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Our sin is removed from us, and God draws us near. Thanks be to God. And in that state of forgiveness, let us offer one another a sign of peace. And I offer my peace to you, saying, may the peace of Christ be with each one of you and also with you. Amen. Good morning, friends. It's time for our children's sermon, so come close so that you can see and hear the message. Today, we're going to be reading a story called Head, Body, Legs. And we're reading this story because in church, we're reading a Bible story that comes from a letter that Paul wrote to the Ephesians, where he talks about unity. Unity is kind of a big word to understand. And so he uses the image of the body and how all our body parts have to work together. And this story is about that. So let's see what we can learn about unity from this story, Head, Body, Legs, a story from Liberia that is retold by Juan de Pei and Margaret Lippert. Are you ready? Long ago, Head was all by himself. He had no legs, no arms, no body. He rolled everywhere. All he could eat were things on the ground that he could reach with his tongue. At night, he rolled under a cherry tree. He fell asleep and dreamed of sweet cherries. One morning, Head woke up and thought, I'm tired of grass and mushrooms. I wish I could reach those cherries. He rolled himself up a little hill. Maybe if I get a good head start, I can hit the trunk hard enough to knock some cherries off, he thought. He shoved with his ears and began to roll down the hill. Here I go, he shouted. Faster and faster he rolled. Crash! Ow! He cried. Who's there? Someone asked. Head looked up. Above him swung two arms he had never seen before. Look down here, Head said, and you'll see. How can we look? Asked arms. We don't have eyes. I have an idea, said Head. Let's get together. I have eyes to see, and you have hands for picking things to eat. Okay, said Arms. They dropped to the ground and attached themselves to the head above the ears. This, said Head, is perfect. Hmm. Hands picked cherries, and Head ate every single one. It's time for a nap, said Head, yawning. Oh, soon he was fast asleep. While Head slept, Body bounced along and landed on top of him. Help! gasped Head. I can't breathe! Arms pushed Body off. Hey! said Body. Stop pushing me. Who are you? It's us, Head and Arms, said Head. You almost squashed us. Watch where you're going. How can I? asked Body. I can't see. Why don't you join us? said Head. I see some ripe mangoes across the river. If you help us swim over there, I'll help you see where you're going. Okay, said Body. 
So Head attached himself to body at the belly button. <laughs> this, said Head, is perfect. They bounced down the bank into the river. Pull right, pull left, Head shouted to arms who paddled frantically against the current. Soon they reached the far bank and bounced up to the mango tree. Pick some, Head ordered. Arms stretched as high as they could, but they couldn't quite reach. Head looked around for a stick. Standing near the tree were two crossed legs and feet on the ends. Get those, Head said to Arms. Arms grabbed them. Let us go, shouted Legs. Who are you, asked Head. We're Legs. We were walking, but we bumped into this tree. Join us, said Head. I have eyes. I can show you where to go and you can help us reach those mangoes. Okay, said Head. So legs attach themselves to the hands. Not there, said arms. The hands need to be free to pick mangoes. I should be in the middle, said body, because I'm the biggest. That's right, said head. You should be at the bottom, legs. I'll swing around on top of body so I can see everything. And arms, you move to the shoulder. Everyone slid into place. Legs stood on tiptoe, body straightened out, Arms stretched up and the hands picked a mango. Head took a bite. Mmm, delicious, Head said. Now this is perfect. The end. Isn't that a fun story? All the body parts were separate and they kept getting put together in the wrong place. Arms on the head. That didn't make sense. <laughs> But finally, when all the parts of the body were working like they were supposed to, they were able to pick and eat a juicy mango. What did you think about that story? Do you think we learned anything about what the word unity means? One thing that it means is that all the parts are working together. Will you guys pray with me? Repeat after me. Dear God, Thank you for all our body parts. Help us to have unity so we can work together and love one another. Amen. All right, friends, I hope you enjoyed the story today. We'll see you next time. Bye. Love my shepherd is whose goodness faileth never. It's something lucky I am his, and he is mine forever. The streams of living water flow. Beside me, 
Our scripture reading today is from the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. I therefore, Paul, the prisoner in the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. But each of us were given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it is said, when he ascended on high, he made captivity itself a captive. He gave gifts to his people. When it says he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is the same one who ascended far above all the heavens so that he might fill all things. The gifts Christ gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity, to the full measure of the full stature of Christ. We must no longer be children, tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by every ligament with which it is equipped as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Olympics started this week, officially kicking off with the opening ceremonies on Friday, which even with COVID always attempt a grand show of global unity. One of the time-honored traditions is to light the Olympic torch. Inspired by ancient torch races in Athens, the tradition of the torch relay, as we know it, began in 1936. And each Olympic Games, the flame is always lit first at ancient Olympia, brought to Athens, and then travels to the host city. 
while often carried on foot, it's also been carried by plane, horse, dog sled, camel, underwater. It's been on a ski jump. It's been canoed. It's been shot with a bow and arrow. The torch bearers are selected to represent the local area. The torches are carried through to foster a sense of togetherness among the community. Our very own Laura Fries once carried the Olympic torch herself through Virginia Highlands preceding the 1996 Olympics here in Atlanta, cheered on by friends and strangers at 4 a.m. Now, as fun as this is, I know the Olympics aren't perfect. There can be cheating. There can be an overwrought sense of nationalism that overwhelms that intended global unity. And this year, there's even controversy regarding whether the game should even be happening in the midst of COVID. But when that torch enters the Olympic Stadium and is passed from hand to hand to the final torch bearer who lights that big Olympic torch that kicks off the games, I just get that good feeling. For a moment, I get that just a little sense of that global unity that we're all in this together, one humanity. Now, Paul writes a lot about unity and oneness in the book of Ephesians. And over the past few weeks, we've been moving through a series titled Turning Me Into Us that connects the book of Ephesians to themes in the Apple TV show Ted Lasso, starring Jason Sudeikis. Ted Lasso is an American football coach hired to coach a premier soccer league, AFC Richmond, in England. Ted Lasso knows nothing about the sport, the country, or the culture, but thanks to his overwhelmingly positive attitude and commitment to building up the players he coaches as individuals and a team, Ted succeeds in surprising ways. Now, the show's only available on Apple TV, unfortunately, but if you want to check it out, you can sign up for a free week trial, and this is a good time to do it because season two just came out on Friday. But be aware, it does contain adult language and humor. It's rated M for mature, so discretion is advised for all who plan to watch. Today, we'll be looking at what the letter to the Ephesians and Coach Lasso has to say about embracing change. Now, if you did a word association game with the word unity, my guess is that the first word that would come to your head would not be change. With unity, we might first think of together, peace, sameness, harmony. But in the letter to the Ephesians we are reading today, there's a pretty good case to be made that moving toward unity means embracing change. Paul is writing to a community made up of Gentiles and Jews who are having a hard time being on the same team. There are questions about whether Gentiles should have to be circumcised like the Jews to be part of the Christian community, or if the Jews need to follow all the laws found in the Torah. To the Ephesians, Paul writes a message of unity. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. Their community is not to be divided over their ethnicity, but united by the gifts and experiences that God has given to each of them as Jew or Gentile to build up the body in love. But as nice as these words sound to our ears today, this is not a gentle encouragement to do better. These are difficult instructions to divided people who Paul is deeply concerned about and is calling on to change their ways, to grow up so that they can carry out the work of the Christ they claimed to love and follow. Ted Lasso knows something about change. Moving from coaching Division II football in Wichita, Kansas to a premier football league in England, he has to learn a whole new sport. He lives a life away from his wife and son. He is constantly ridiculed by English football fans who expect him to fail. And in the midst of all of that, he is genuinely attempting to change the lives and hearts of the player on his team, all of them. 
Jamie Tart is a young hotshot star player and is the only reason the team has been getting any wins. He's good. He's great, in fact, the single best player on the team. In Coach Lasso's words, he's the best athlete he has ever coached. But to put it kindly, Jamie is not a team player. Over and over again, despite Ted Lasso's inspirational coaching messages to turn me into us, Jamie seems to only care about himself. He does score big goals, but he never thinks to pass the ball, caring more about the audience's praise for his performance than anything else. In episode five, Coach Lasso has had enough of this behavior. During a game, AFC Richmond is down by two in the first six minutes when Tart scores. The crowd goes wild, but rather than celebrating with his team, he runs around the field at him and points at himself saying, me, me, me. At one point in the game, another player, Sam Obasanya, gets hurt and the, chief, the team captain, Roy, tells Tart to check on him. But Tart refuses, sparking a fight on the field. As they near halftime, Tart scores a goal that ties the game. The crowd goes wild again. But after watching how he played and the team's exasperation with his lack of cooperation, Coach Lasso decides to make a change and he benches Jamie. The crowd is stunned. The team is frustrated, both with Jamie's behavior and this big mid-game change. Why would Coach Lasso bench his star player? The team gets into the locker room for the halftime pep talk and Ted drops this wisdom on his remaining players. Most of the time, change is a good thing. I think that's what it's all about, embracing change, being brave, doing whatever you have to so that everyone in your life can move forward with theirs. I think that's part of the message that the Ephesians needed to hear, that we need to hear. The call to unity is not a call to stay the same, be the very best, be the same, do the same thing. Call, Paul names the gifts that Christ has given, that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ. Our marching orders aren't to go out there and be the star prophet, but to be completely humble and gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love. Bearing with one another in love, that's the tough part. If getting closer to unity requires growth, then unity means embracing change. That's a hard thing to do together. Your church leaders are discerning what changes are ahead of us as a congregation. Changes in the time of worship, in what we're gonna offer online and in person, in who will serve on our staff, in how we will work with our mission partners. And guess what? You're not gonna like all the changes. Some of us will be disappointed with what time worship will be. Some of us will wish to return to all the same events that we did in 2019. We miss beloved staff members who have moved on to their next callings and we'll wish that those serving in their roles now would do it like the other people used to. We will remember that special mission trip from the past that we want to recreate. But unity will not look like a complete return to the former. It will emerge from growth towards what's next as we bear with one another's disappointments and frustrations and embrace change. Our whole lives have been wrapped up in expanding and constricting change this past year. And I think it remains to be seen if it is unity that will emerge. In day-to-day -day living, it doesn't feel like it in this pandemic year when we hear alarm bells ringing around the Delta variant that is causing case counts to rise and hospitalizations to increase, particularly among the unvaccinated. Will we live in ways that will allow everyone around us to move forward with their lives 
as a people joined and knit together? We can't see how it ends yet. We are not creators of unity. We can't make it happen. It's God's work to fill all things. But we are called to care and nurture unity in the ways we treat one another. When we hear the metaphor of the church as the body, with Christ as the head, an image that comes up a few times in Paul's letters, I think we'd like to think of ourselves as the hands or the feet, running the race, carrying the torch, doing the hands-on work of Christ. But here in Ephesians, Paul's saying that we're not the hands and feet at all. We are parts unseen, called to be ligaments, fibrous and flexible connective tissue that connects the bones or cartilage or joints holding things together. Ligaments don't cause growth. You can't really make them stronger than they're built to be. Their job is to keep all the parts of the body together, all the different parts, as it changes and grows and moves and works. So Jamie Tart, he doesn't need to be less good at soccer to be part of the team. It's amazing how good he is. He just needs to work on his job as a ligament, connecting and supporting other parts of the team. And don't worry, little spoiler, he will find a little redemption eventually. Coach Lasso certainly demonstrates one instance of what it looks like to bear with one another and speak the truth in love when he benches Jamie Tart at halftime. At the end of his speech, the team goes back out onto the field without Jamie. And in the last two minutes of the game, Richmond has the ball with team captain Roy Kent driving it down the field. He could have gone for the goal, but at the last second, he passes it to wide open Sam, who sinks it into the goal for the win. The team and the crowd explodes with joy because together they experienced a moment of unity, of the body working together with one another to build one another up and achieve the purpose of the soccer team, to win. The purpose of unity in a soccer team and in the church is different, obviously. We aren't here to win games and to pump up the crowd, but we are here to train and practice for our own calling to unity. As Paul says, to promote the body's growth in building itself up in love. We are here showing up as ourselves, connecting with one another's God-given gifts to grow together, to do what we can to help one another move forward with our lives as we embrace change. Because according to Paul, there's nothing static about unity. The church has changed a great deal since this letter was written. The early church could hardly have imagined how this message would shape what Paul looks like today. Even the earliest members of Pleasant Hill probably didn't quite know what it would look like for us in 30 plus years to be meeting in this big sanctuary or online, to be pastored by three women, to be doing ministry in a laundromat, to be having a party after church for a group of children and families, to be welcoming and inviting into worship and leadership people who go far beyond the labels of Jews and Gentiles. Already we have embraced change, and as we grow into the maturity of faith, serving as ligaments holding together the many parts of the body, growing into the unity Christ calls us to, we will have to change again. At the end of Ted's halftime speech, he says, hey, 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 one last thing, and I want everyone's eyes on me when I say this. Reaching up, he smacks a sign that hangs above his office door that says, believe. Believe. Embracing change is the unity we are called to by God. So let's go get out on the field. Amen. Together, let us affirm our faith using the newest confession of faith found in our book of confessions. This is adapted from the Confession of Belhar, which comes out of the context of apartheid in South Africa. And the themes of this confession are all about unity. 
So let us say what we believe. We believe that Christ's work of reconciliation is made manifest in the church as the community of believers who have been reconciled with God and with one another. We believe that unity is a gift and an obligation for the church of Jesus Christ, that through the working of God's spirit, it is a binding force, yet simultaneously a reality which must be earnestly pursued and sought one which the people of God must continually be built up to attain. We believe that this unity can be established only in freedom and not under constraint, that the variety of spiritual gifts, opportunities, backgrounds, convictions, as well as the various languages and cultures are by virtue of the reconciliation in Christ, opportunities for mutual service, and enrichment within the one visible people of God. Amen. It's time to go to God in prayer. First, silently, I'll lead us in a pastoral prayer, and then we'll conclude by together saying the Lord's Prayer. So, let us pray. Lord, we are changing every second of every day in our community, whether we choose to or not. We live in a shifting world where our resources ebb and flow. Households form and disband. Work opportunities flourish and falter. Give us the wisdom to accept those things that we cannot change. When we are standing in abundance, grant us the humility to receive with grace and the generosity to share with others. When our community changes to become less hospitable, remind us of your never failing presence with us. Embolden us to embrace the less familiar and adopt new thinking and fresh ideas into our lives of following you. Holy God, change can result in growth. We feel it physically as we move through our childhood to adulthood and feel our muscles expand, our ligaments stretch our stride lengthen. We see it as we look back through old photos and remember what was and wonder at what we have become. We ask that like us, this church will also grow so that we may embrace new members and reach out to those in our community who are hungry for friendship, assistance, and especially a deep faith in you, our Lord and Savior. May the physical improvements to this church's prayer garden and playground sow the seeds of relationship. So one day we can look back and remember what was and what we have become and know that it is good. We acknowledge this morning, God, that some changes hurt. Some changes cut us to the quick. We struggle with failing mental health, with love that wanes, with the deep longing that follows loss. We sigh as we receive a new diagnosis, suffer the invisible pain of infertility, or learn of yet another friend who is moving away. The burdens we bear 
are more easily carried when they rest on many shoulders. So empower us to be vulnerable with one another, to reveal what hurts. Perhaps our honesty will bless others as much as it blesses us. And perhaps our disclosure will lead to our receiving help or joining a support group or simply knowing another one of your faithful followers is praying on our behalf. We thank you for those who have changed who they are and what they do in response to this pandemic. We give thanks for our healthcare workers, our teachers, our social justice leaders, our first responders, our counselors, our politicians, and all who have adapted their jobs to the changes in our world. They have inspired us. Their resolve to make their work reflect your desire for a peaceable kingdom where suffering and injustice are no more leads to change for the good in all of us. So finally, Lord Jesus, we ask that our hearts be ever changing. Walking in your footsteps means navigating an ever-changing landscape, but always, always keeping both our eyes on you. If we wander from the path, nudge us back on track. If we are stubborn, soften us to adapt. If we are hesitant, encourage us to share the good news that you, the Holy One, gave your very self for us so we may know how to love, how to look beyond ourselves, and how to view the world as one giant we. And we ask all these things using the words our Savior Jesus Christ taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Jenny has invited us to give our gifts to build up the body, to set aside our selfish desires so that others may live the life they were fully created to live. Give in faith. There are many ways to give to Pleasant Hill Presbyterian, all of which are listed on your screen. Let us dedicate our gifts to God. Generous Lord, use our gifts to empower change, change for the good, change that leads to justice, dignity, playfulness, and compassion for all of your creation. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Friends, we are one body and one spirit called to the one hope of our calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in all. So in that unity, go out today embracing change, knowing that our God, our creator, Jesus Christ, our redeemer, and the Holy Spirit, our sustainer, is with us on the journey. Amen.